raising the IQ and bankrolls of sports bettors everywhere. The Better IQ Podcast is your source for sports betting information, analysis, and opinions. Learn. Bet. Win. Better IQ. Good afternoon and welcome to the Better IQ podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lang. Hope you had a, a great uh, week and as uh, we enter the uh, the grind here of the uh, summer. And for today, uh, we're going to continue some of our uh, sports betting uh, theory uh, discussion. Uh, we've had uh, some tremendous uh, discussions here over the course of the last, what, two months. We really encourage you to go back uh, because the information obviously still uh, uh, still pertinent. Uh, you can go back and uh, listen uh, to some of the uh, the topics. We talked live betting. Uh, we talked uh, the impact of uh, coaches betting on futures. Really just a, 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 a tutorial on how to attack sports betting. We're going to continue to build on that here uh, moving uh, forward. And uh, for today, a uh, very interesting uh, topic and uh, one that is, um, it, it, I think, and I talk with our guests here off air, it's becoming more and more challenging, uh, and that being uh, preseason uh, preparation, what you are doing uh, to uh, hit the ground running, so to speak, uh, with uh, each sport. And each sport is different, and we'll break that down here uh, with our guests for this afternoon, Mr. Eric Waz. Let's welcome in. Waz, how are you? Doing good, Andrew. Uh, it's a good timing for this topic, I feel like, with uh... – Football season right around the corner. It's still a couple months away, but we're getting close to that time here. I think the All Star break for baseball is usually a uh, kind of a benchmark for where a lot of handicappers sit down and say, "Okay, time to start looking at the football annuals, get my mind a little set for football, and start uh, switching gears." So, uh, great timing on this podcast. Yeah, and look, each sport is different. Let, let's start first. Uh, you, you mentioned you got football around the corner, so l- l- let's start here with the with, with football and and. Here's my first question, Waz. How, how early are you are you starting? Look, there's already you know college football, NFL, NFL. There's a full market right now. Uh, college football. There's sides on all of Week One games. Uh, there's there's futures up. There's season over under uh, win totals. A lot of which Waz has already been bet into. I, I I checked the other day, and college football. There's been some pretty significant line moves already. So it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and, and that that puts. I don't want to say pressure, but that, that, that begs the question. You know, again, how early should you start diving in to, to football? I, the answer is probably, if you haven't already, you're, you're, you're behind, but on the same uh, token, and we'll get into this a little bit further, where you can almost do too much preseason work and it really not end up paying dividends, and that's something that I've – I admit that I've I've fallen into uh, in uh, recent years where I'm scrambling. I'm trying to know absolutely everything. I think I got to read on some of these teams, was, and then when I see the product actually on the field of play, it's often quite different, and I end up being kind of frustrated about. Well, I spent all this time trying to handicap the teams. Now, don't get me wrong; I was able to gain some edges, but uh, not as much as I would like. So, uh, back to my original question here: How early should we start handicapping? Let's say football. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's a loaded question because I'll be honest; I could talk to a dozen guys here in Las Vegas who bet for a living, and get a dozen different answers about when they start, how they start, you know. Uh, and I look at Eddie, for instance. I mean, that guy's he's a maniac. He's starting back in March for the upcoming college football season, six months before. I think that's <laughs> that's quite early. That's probably the earliest of anybody I've ever heard of, but, you know, it pays off for him. I mean, he's seeing things before everybody else sees them, and he's always ahead of everybody else in their research. So uh, it's a good question. For me, my sweet spot has always been uh, late June, early July for football. Um you know, I've already looked through for NFL, the, the NFC North, and a couple other teams. I don't go all in. I'll be honest. I, I kind of ease into it. I'm just kind of reading a little bit online. I got a couple of the magazines, uh, the Lindy's, the Athlons of the World, Street and Smiths, flipping through a little bit. Um, and I sort of, sort of increase it over time. I mean, as we get closer and closer to the season, I ramp up and do a little bit more each week. So right now, I'm probably spending about 10 hours a week uh, or so looking at NFL you know, maybe in a couple weeks from now, I'm spending 12 hours a week, then 15. Then, you know, I get to the point where once the season gets here, I'm, I'm all in. So eh, there's no right answer, though. There really isn't. I mean, you can do it different ways. I know a lot of guys who cram in like the two weeks before, 
everything they need in those two weeks. And, and they just, you know, a lot of late nights and they prefer it that way because you know, we'll talk about this here in a little bit with, with injuries and things that change along the way. Uh, if you're starting this early right now, let's say for football, there's going to be things that change. We're going to see, you know, definitely uh, some injuries. We're going to see some, um, some coaches that come out with some really powerful quotes or, or, you know, style of play type things that you're going to notice. And um, just some big factors are going to affect the handicap. So you got to be careful when you do start really early um, that you kind of go back and give every, every team a second look because so much changes. And we know nowadays with all the information available at our fingertips that, um, you know, if you're not going back and looking, you're definitely going to miss a few things here and there. Taking it a step further, wise, let's use college football for an example. And, and, and this may be a statement that people will think that is a, perhaps a little bit harsh, but college football, what, what do we think of in the preseason? You, you mentioned the annuals, in particular, like Phil Steele. Mm-hmm. I've gotten the point, I don't buy Phil Steele anymore. Okay. Um, I, I, I quit. And, and it's not like Phil Steele, there isn't any, you know, there, there, there's good information in Phil Steele. Um, a lot of it isn't good information, but there is a lot of good information. There's a lot of good information with a lot of publications out there. And you can find nuggets, Waz. And, and maybe I shouldn't go so far as to say, hey, don't buy annuals. Don't, don't bother with that stuff. But what I found, was, by and large, especially in the preseason, I think that's the time to start getting creative, start getting, you know, thinking outside the box, trying to find information that is not going to be accounted for in that week one line. And it's hard. It's hard, but um, we we know this. Phil Steele probably doesn't have the influence that he used to have. The betting markets are, are a little bit more sophisticated. But yep. if, if Phil Steele comes up, and I'm using Phil for an example, but if he comes up with a with an angle that a um, a sophisticated better looks at and says, "Wow, uh, that that that's pretty good," I'll go ahead and tell you right now that that game is getting bet that way. Uh, it's yep. it, it's going to be accounted for in, in the market. And that kind of goes back to what I talked about where, you know, t- time management. And I, I know guys, they get super excited for football and they read that Athlon, they read that Phil Steele cover to cover. Well, let me ask you the question, you know, what what did you get from that? Um, you know, if you're doing it for a hobby, uh, you just like to read, that's fine. But I'm the type of guy where, you know, my, my time is valuable wise. And, and if I'm reading something and I know, uh, it, it's going to be baked into that line or the market is going to move on that information, then, you know, you're, you're, you're wasting time. And that's kind of why I, you know, with these preseason annuals, uh, the blue ribbon, for example, with college basketball, it's great. It's great, but it's great for a reason. And betters know that. The information is so good that you know they 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 take out the numbers and and that could be uh, frustrating. So what 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 are kind of your thoughts, uh, particularly with you know football and the preseason annuals, the websites? Bill Conley, for example, is great, but all that stuff that is just so readily available to the public. What do you recommend to the average better out there and how to approach? Do you leave it alone? Do you read it with a grain of salt? Do you dive in? What do you do? Yeah, well, first for things first, you mentioned Phil Steele. I wholeheartedly agree with with that assessment that it's lost most of its value if not all of its value um he, he's very friendly with all the coaches and and he comes at every team with a very positive approach yes. you don't get an objective review of each team which is unfortunate because it used to be very objective and, and very valuable but he sort of went the way of hey i'm more of a media guy now and i make my living you know doing interviews with the coaches and be on radio shows all over the country and in this thing. So his, his magazine isn't nearly as good. Um, and a lot of it's just stats and, and, and trends and whatnot. And we, we know, you know, those are, you get those anywhere, right? Not just his magazine. So we'll say that first. Um, but overall, as far as the publications, I mean, I, I'm sort of in the middle. I mean, there's definitely value in reading the preseason annuals. Um, depending on the sport, I do read a couple of them for each sport. Um, what I'm looking for really is I'm kind of reading between the lines a little bit. I'm not always just saying, hey, you know, this team made this, this, these additions are going to be this much better on offense or defense or, hey, they got this new coach. Here's how they're going to play. I'm kind of looking at it from a perspective of, all right, what would somebody reading this get from it? And then what on top of that should I be able to deduct from reading this that's maybe, you know, if I read between the lines a little bit, kind of take it a step further, um, you know, how can I – 
find an angle or, or something that's going to come up in a game or, or the way a team plays that maybe isn't so black and white when you read it, but you can just figure it out like almost like a puzzle. So um, I think it just takes years of, of reading those magazines and kind of getting used to like the what's lip service, what the coaches say that's kind of like, hey, you know, it's the standard way we, we talk about how we're going to do offense or defense. And then there's also the, okay, this guy's opening up a little bit more. I'm actually getting something really good when he talks. Um, it just takes a while to kind of sift through that, you know, that garbage and realize what's good and what's not. So um, I use them. Um, if I did my entire handicap based on those annuals, I, I can guarantee you it wouldn't be a good season for any sport. Um, you got to definitely go further with it. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things. It's, you know, each person does it differently. I know guys who don't use the magazines at all. Um, I know guys who do a lot of the, the online previews of certain sites. Um, a lot of guys that, that do things on their own and really. It really depends on your handicapping style. You know, the, the the modelers out there, the numbers guys out there, they're not reading hardly anything. You know, they're just taking numbers from last year and looking maybe at uh, some of the turnover and returning starters and things like that in minutes and, you know, putting into formulas. So those guys aren't reading at all. So it depends on what kind of handicap you are, what your style is. I'm more of a reader than most, so I do see some value in the annuals, but uh, it's definitely not the only way to go about it. Well, my, my next point here is, and you, you mentioned this, Waz, where uh, a starting point, I, I think a good starting point, and look, I, I fully subscribe to, uh, you know, tell me what's going to happen, not what's occurred, uh, you know, philosophy, that's, that's you got to have that if you're going to be a successful sports better, but I think a good starting point is going back and just looking at the results, looking at the results, looking at a body of work, whether, you know, it could be a cumulative team box score, um, it, it, it could be, you know, you, you alluded to it, Waz, maybe isolating those teams that were quote unquote lucky or unlucky in football case, you know, teams, you know, you see a good football team with a really, really bad turnover margin or a bad football team with a really, really good turnover margin. Uh, th- those are good starting points. You know, going back and you don't need to spend too much time, especially in college. You talked about it, Waz, where you got so much turnover roster wise year to year. But I think that it pays to kind of go back and, and, you know, almost like a refresher course. Go back and, and look, you, you know, I, I, I don't write enough down. A lot of it is just, you know, you have it, it's memory. But sometimes I'll go back and let's say I'm writing a preseason article on a, on a team or a conference and I'll go back and be like, holy cow, I remember that team. And, and that team, you know, was, was unlucky, was lucky, whatever it is. But going back and kind of, you know, scouring over what took place uh, last year, uh, you know, say you spend, you know, a couple days doing it, you'd be surprised. You can get through a lot of college football uh, teams uh, doing that. But that's that. I think that's a good starting point. Yeah, that's an important step. I mean, you want to look at things like like point differentials, run differentials, yeah, records in close games, and you know how how tough was the schedule in the previous year? You know, that's a big big factor that, especially for football in the NFL particularly. Uh, the schedule is so big. So, you know, you see some misleading records. What you want to try to find is teams that had good or bad seasons last year that for whatever reason, the record doesn't tell the whole story. I mean, did they have a lot of injuries throughout the season maybe that they, they, they kind of masked some really good potential and some good talent? Um, did they get off to a slow start and things kind of unraveled? Um, you know, were, were they lucky or unlucky? For, you said turnovers, that's great. Maybe penalties, and for football, some teams get overly penalized one year, and you realize, man, there's no way they're not going to improve that this year. It's they're going to get better and, and commit less penalties. Um, obviously, the roster turnover is huge. Uh, we hit on coaches a little bit. Uh, we've had a, we did an entire coaching podcast uh, a few weeks back, Andrew. So I won't go into full detail on that, but we mentioned on that podcast that one of the biggest drivers of value early on in the season for handicappers is identifying new coaches who came from programs before where they had success and now coming into a bad program where they can turn things out to to turn things around in a hurry. Um, Those are great spots and and vice versa as well. Getting bad coaches who come on and, 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 you know, maybe things go the other direction. So um, definitely you got to look at the coaching staff, not just the head coach. We we mentioned the assistants as well. So go back and listen to that uh, podcast on coaches because that's really important part of the handicap uh, preseason as well, Andrew. Coaches is huge. I mean, you know, I actually think we need to build on it just because, I mean, you can, Waz, literally, you know, take, take college football for, for an example. By and large, 
the talent level of a program stays very similar year to year. Okay, you could get a, a you know a better than average you know you could have a quarterback like an impact player that could rise you know help help the team rise up or you know maybe you're going through a transition. Let's say you lose you know a lot of uh, you know your core of your offensive line and, and things like that. That happens. That matters. But more importantly. You know, if you can accurately handicap a new coaching staff, and look, you, you hit, that was wonderful that you pointed out with Phil Steele. He's going to spin every new coaching staff positively. I'm telling you, the cash cow is if you can isolate those college football teams. It doesn't matter what sport. You can isolate those teams where a new regime is going to come in, and it's a bad program, and the program is going to decline. Okay, because the the market is predisposed to assume improvement with a new uh, coaching staff, and we know that isn't always the case. So my my point being with with the coaching staff, not screw the players because the players are important. It's nice to know the personnel, the returning starters, but if you can accurately handicap a new coaching staff, and Eddie does this, we had him on the other day talking head coaching changes. You got to go back and listen. If you can accurately handicap those, especially the first three weeks of the season, two weeks of the season before the market catches on, that is with that's one of the biggest money makers in college football was. Yeah, and you want to look for the under the radar guys because everybody knows that the big programs they get a new coach. There's a hundred articles being written about that coach, and you kind of know that coach just through the media alone. Even if you're not doing a lot of researching, you kind of have a feel for that coach instantly. And there's already people putting out opinions on them, and, and it's it's well known. So look for the under the radar coaches. Spend more time studying them, even for personnel changes for the for the players that are turning over. You know. All the high-profile guys, and we talked about last year on the podcast many times, Andrew, about the Rams. Remember the Rams, all the guys they, they got in the offseason the year before and added you know, guys like Atomic and Sue and, and just bolstered their defense and they had every, made every right move in the, in, the, in the preseason. And we knew going into the season they were going to be overrated, and of course they were. I think they ended up going like 7-9 and nine against the spread or 6-10 and 10 against the spread that year uh, because everybody was, was well-documented. They made all these big moves. So – you want to find the teams that make personnel changes that are kind of going under the radar a little bit. Maybe they've made only a couple of moves, but they're, they're maybe they're guys on the offensive line or defensive line. They're big difference makers that don't get the the same publicity that a you know quarterback would get or or a, a big defensive pass rusher would get. So look for under the radar moves, both with coaches and personnel changes. You'll be far, far, far ahead of everybody else when you're handicapping preseason. I'm a cherry pick one. Here, here, here's here's your example where the Yost guy, the offensive coordinator at Utah State, you know, Matt Wells was on his way to losing his job at Utah State. That, that's, that's a program where the expectation is to win. He had a couple of down seasons. He brings in Yost, and it took some time, Waz, but who had the best spread record in college football last year? Utah State. Okay? So, and look, you know, you got to go out and find those guys, and not every guy is a home run. But that that that's a really good example where you know I think in the college football the diehard circles people were kind of aware of Yost. He had a little bit of a pedigree, a background. But could anyone have forecasted that Utah State was arguably the most potent offense in all the college? You know, relative to what the competition they were playing. I mean, they were they were one of the most exciting offenses in all college football last season. And Matt Wells, to his credit. He's like, all right, we got to get a little bit more creative. But that 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 increase, that success, that ATS success was, pre, you know, it, it was because of Yost. He stepped in, and, and that's that. Those are the type of guys, not the the high profile head coach. Yeah, and then the other thing too is you want to try to get inside the head of the team. I think going into a season, right? Like, what what's the team thinking? A lot of times, a lot of teams are on the same page. Everybody's kind of excited about a new season. Hey, this this could be our year. We made some moves we're positive about, but not every team is in that boat. There's always a few teams going in. You're like, man, this is going to be a, a rebuilding year. Um, there's still a couple of years away. Maybe they have a lame duck coach, or they have a new coach that 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 you know wasn't the right fit, and people are already kind of you know questioning it. So go in and kind of get into the psychology of the team. And and you know, Alan Boston, a famous handicapper, always says, "Be the team," right? Be the team, get inside their head, what they're thinking in the locker room. Um, and that helps you a lot in the handicapping early on this season because that psychological mind state really is kind of an underrated aspect of handicapping in general. It probably is worthy of an entire podcast by itself. But I think in the preseason, 
Uh, if you can get a good handicap, a good feel for what the team's thinking, uh, you can find some really good spots those first two, three weeks of the season. Waz, let me ask you, are you a uh, a pessimist or an optimist when it comes to, you mentioned it, with the, by and large, the uh, the information presented on a team, annuals, articles, whatever, is going to be positive. Okay, the the local media, you know, they'll mention, well, there's some question marks, but uh, by and large, you know, people are going to focus in on, well, this team was five and six last year. They're going to focus on the positives. This team's going to improve. And I'm, you know, especially with college kids, I subscribe to the theory that a sophomore is going to be better than he was when he was a freshman, a junior, you know, and, and on down the line. Now, it's not as cut and dry as that. I used to, I, I admit, I used to be more of a, wow, this team, you know, they, they got 16 returning starters. Uh, they were only five and six last year, but everything's, you know, everything's falling into place. They're going to be great. Not as easy as that. So I, I'm, I try to take more of a neutral approach. Uh, like you said, kind of read between the uh, the lines. Are you one of those guys that tends to side with? Let's just say you take a program that everyone returns. They got a good core of group, uh, players back, coaching staff, uh, everyone back. Um, are, are you jumping in saying, you know, all right, this team's going to improve, or you know, again, a wait and see approach? What's what's some of your techniques? There probably isn't a factor that gets overrated as much as returning experience, I think, in, in, in preseason handicapping. I really think that gets way overblown, especially in like college football with the returning starters. I mean, if you got a program that went two and nine, you know, last year and, and, and they're all juniors and now they're all seniors, and everybody said, Oh, they got everybody back and they're all seniors now. I can almost guarantee that team's not gonna be much better. I mean, they have had three years to get better and here they are at two and nine their junior year. Um so I think that, you know, you have to use those stats kind of take with a grain of salt. Um you mentioned the kind of the spin that that, that people put on the, the beat writers or the people writing those preview magazines, trying to put a positive spin on on the teams and the outlook. That's a really important point. I don't want to gloss over because you have to be really careful. We just mentioned Phil Steele, how he's very, you know, positive about every team now, and he's he's kind of in bed with these coaches now and all these shows. You have to take that and say, hey. This guy has a job. His job is to preview this conference or this team, and his job is somehow tied into that team, um, whether he's a beat writer or whatnot. It works for the conference, uh, a certain website that has an affiliation with the schools. There's always a tie in there, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, I try to be objective and, and, and you know read through that. After a while, like I said before, you get a feel for – you know, what's just lip service? You hear the standard language every year. One of the examples you hear in college basketball all the time, and it really bothers me, is every coach wants to play up-tempo early on in the season. Oh, we're going to play faster this year. we got more athletes, and we're going to run, 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 run. Never happens. Like, it rarely happens. Like, they say that because it sounds good, and, you know, they, they, they got the athletes now. We should take advantage and get more possessions in a game. And then you got, then you got the beat writers who are always positive about, hey, we made these additions. We improved – you know, these three areas of our team, they never really focus on how the team has gotten worse. Like where have they lost guys and where are they going to be hurting a little bit? It's always, everybody's always excited and optimistic about the the, the beginning of a season. There's always, you know, bright spots to, to focus on. And those bright spots tend to get focused on a lot more than the weak spot, weak spots get focused on. So I'm usually looking when I'm reading through the annuals or reading through online articles, trying to find the weak spots of those teams, because those don't get talked about and exposed as much. But they're definitely there. I mean, almost every team has them. They're just not the, the center of an article. They're not the center of a preview. If you can find those and look at those more objectively, I think it would be in a lot better spot. And building on that returning starters concept, and too many betters, they, 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 that, and there's, it's bolded. That's the first thing you see on a uh, Phil Steele page. It, it, it's the ranking, and then you see that raw number of you know 17 returning starters or opposite end of the spectrum, you only have nine. And uh, Advantage Group, uh, they wrote a great article. I encourage you to go read it and kind of build on what you talked about, Waz, where, you know, being creative, thinking a little little outside the box where, you know, you got that team that is not very good and they're returning everyone. Yeah, in theory, those players should be a little bit better uh, just based on experience. But, you know, what, what's, what's their ceiling versus 
let's take that same team. You got a new coaching staff coming in. You got a bunch of transfers that I, I admit it's hard to keep track of these guys. Some guys will pan out. Some guys won't. Maybe they inked a better than you know average recruiting class. Now that that team, you may not reap the benefits of that team the first couple of weeks of the season. But what I'm doing is I'm marking that team for hey the back half of the season. This team this it's got potential for growth versus. The team that again everyone's in place and it's the same you know cesspool of mediocrity uh, which we see year in and year out with the college of football. So uh, you know being creative and, and and you know leaving the door open. I think was you you touched on it, leaving the door open for those teams where the generic media is writing them off. That's the big. I yep. want I want to read about those teams that have quote unquote no chance. Yeah, I you want, mentioned you mentioned you alluded to it in. in- what you just said about having some expectations going in of your own. Like you want to know, Hey, this team, I think they're a bet on team or a team. I'm going to fade or maybe second half of the season. I'm going to focus on this. Maybe that's an over or an under or whatever it is. You should probably, when you're reading through each team and previewing the season for the sport, you're handicapping, have a, uh, you know, a designation, whether you're taking notes or doing this on a computer that, Hey, this is a team I'm looking to back a team looking to fade, go over or under the total has some preconceived notion based on what you read. Um, and then maybe on top of that, we talked about this in the power rating uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago. Put them in buckets like uh, of how confident you are. Like there's going to be some teams of everybody coming back. You know what you're getting. Same coach, same system, da-da-da. You should be very confident in how you assess that team. You should know that, hey, this is an over team. I want to bet mostly overs if the numbers are in these ranges. Or, hey, I'm looking to fade this team. They, they, you know, they're getting a little bit too much pub for all the returning starters, whatever it is. And then teams you're not sure about, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, you're saying, hey, a lot of turnover on this team. They're hard to read. Maybe I need to see them play a game or two or three before I get a comfortable feeling on how I'm going to rate this team. But at least have some notes or some, some something in your head to say, hey, here's how I'm approaching this team going into the season. Because a lot of people don't do that, and they end up going in without any, without any thinking at all. And then they're kind of doing things on the fly and trying to figure it out you know, game after game. I think it kind of helps to have like a baseline. And when things go a little differently than you expect, you dig in and say, okay, why this happened? Is this, is this you know, is this just kind of box scores being weird? Or is this really, um, you know, what's what's really happening? So I think for me, it helps me. And, and I'm not the same as everybody else. Other guys do it different ways. Other guys want to see a couple of games. They don't make a single bet the first two weeks. Uh, for me, I like having a, 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 a stance on a team and saying, hey, here's what I believe in this team. And then see if it plays out or not. And if it plays out in the first game or two, I know I can probably ride that for a little while. Whereas if it goes the other way, I'll sit back and say, "Man, I need to take a step back and and uh, take a pass on these teams' games for the next two or three games before I see a, a pattern emerge or something." So, I think having a take on a team is big, um, and you know, trying to put a, a rating as well. I don't know, Andrew, if you're a big preseason rating guy. I don't have a, a, a set rating like I do during the season. It's more of an informal. Um, range of, of rating so to speak for me but what are your thoughts on hey going into the season with a preseason power rating or are you kind of waiting a, a couple of weeks in to see okay let me see where this team plays for a couple of weeks and see how they look and then put a more of an accurate power rating on a team then yeah i'm not necessarily a, a power rating guy but i'll go back and tell you look you don't even need to be a you know an ultra sophisticated better and i and I, this is something that has plagued me throughout my career. I do the other approach, Waz, where I keep it simple. I am a guy that likes to see teams play a couple of times. And if I miss out on a couple of opportunities, I'm comfortable in my own skin where I, I move on. I'll be able to apply that information down the road. I know I will. But keeping it as simple, take college football, and like you said, take in the swatch of teams of like, all right, here's my list of seven over teams. And, and you're, you're, you're coming up with this list in, say, June or July or bet against teams or, or bet against early, bet on late, whatever it is, having those notes, I promise you, and I don't adhere to it strongly enough, I can't tell you how many teams that I peg for over and something will happen. I'll lose a bet really bad or a player will get injured or I'll see something and I'll end up jumping ship and then I'll go back and it's like I, you end up kicking yourself. I'm telling you, you can, yep. you, you know, there's winners to be had even without seeing the games, even without a point spread on the games. Um, doing this is, is it, man, it's an excellent tool. I, I can't recommend it strongly enough. And, and don't get me wrong, 
I know it firsthand. It's hard to adhere to what you're writing down in June because there's a lot of unknowns in June. There's a lot of unknowns in July. But if you do this long enough and stick to it, I, I think was that it, it's 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 a it's a huge money maker. It, it, it really it really is. Yeah, another thing too. I mean, we, you know, this kind of bounced around here a little bit. It just popped in my head. But when you're reading through these preseason annuals, or you're reading online articles, or if you, even if you're waiting until the season starts, the first couple of weeks, and you're reading through game recaps or game previews or whatnot, just based on the fact there's so many teams, especially in a college football or college basketball, there's so many teams to cover. You've really got to develop a skill where you're not reading every single thing you look at word for word. You've got to do some skimming. I mean, if you're going to read things word for word, you never have enough time in the day or the week to get through every team and every game. You're going to develop a skill where you're really good at skimming and finding information. And if you're kind of, like I said, focusing too much on I want to get every single word in, make sure you don't miss anything, uh, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're not going to get through all the teams. You're going to be tired. Um, you have to develop that that skimming uh technique and it's for me it's huge i mean i I, after reading so many of these previews and and articles online about teams you kind of know just once you start skimming over where the sweet spot is where the information is going to be i look for quotes a lot look for quotation marks on the page read those obviously because they're coming straight from the coach or the players so um just something that popped in my head or andrew because if if you're going to do this the right way and be able to cover all the teams you have to develop a way of quickly going through all these teams because it's just too much to read uh, everything out there, just too much of it. All right, here, here's the next, and again, I'm cherry picking. This was a, a wonderful article written by Advantage Group, and they pointed out using the preseason, we talked about Waz, there's lines up on everything right now, everything. Well, one tool could be to track the market, okay? When a game moves in July or June, they're not setting up a point spread, Waz. Um, that, that, you know, you use the, the, they use the term dumb money. So you can, and here's the example that was used in the article, uh, UMass football. Okay. And we talked with Eddie about this. So UMass football is bringing in a new coach, Walt Bell is a young guy. He was the uh, offensive coordinator there at Florida state. And I don't know if Eddie had anything to do with this. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but reading the betting markets early on and, and look, you're not stealing information but you you're, you're seeing what other betters are thinking betters that more often than not was are probably more talented than you know the average better listening out there so um UMass opened a 10 point underdog against Boston College and that game moved to 14 and a half their season under over under win total went from four and a half to four and a half under 320 okay <laughs> wow. yeah so uh, again that and does that automatically mean that UMass is going to be an awful football team? No, no. You know, I'm I'm firmly of the belief that you know you need to be forming more of your opinions. You know, a majority of them need to be organic. But there's a great indication where just by following the market, you can go ahead and jot down in your notes like market heavy against UMass. Here we are. We're not even to July, and there's a four and a half point line move, and I'll guarantee that line's going higher. Okay? Yeah, that, that opens up a great. A great point, Andrew. Just something that popped in my head as well is, you know, I did this back like four years ago, I think. Um, and I don't think I did it for all the sports. I, to be honest, I can't remember which sports I did it for, which ones I didn't. But week one, um, it had to be for NFL and college. I think I did them both. But anyways, I studied the line movements for week one, NFL and college. And I went back and looked at how did the, the opening line compare to the closing line. And, of course, the opening line, you get some of these big moves, four, five, six points. If you got the opening number and, and, and got those bets in on the right teams, you did extremely well, obviously. You get a lot of equity in those bets, and obviously you're going to win a lot more of those than you lose. However, using your UMass example, if you still bet against them at the new number, right, and you know what you said went from, what, 10 to 14.5? Is that what you said, Andrew? Yeah. Okay, so that 14.5 number, if you still made the bet there against, you know, laid the 14.5 against them, their actual the results of the closing line – uh, on those actually comes out to the point where if you actually fade the move at the closing line, you actually do really well. So it, what these what happens to these games is they get overly bet in one direction so far that it creates value on the other side because mm-hmm. everybody wants to be on the information that's pointing to that team, or in this case it's pointing against the team, UMass. Nobody wants to take the other side because all the things you read preseason, uh, the annuals, the articles online, whatever the injuries are, coaches, whatever it is, your handicap. Nothing points to betting on UMass. But at the same time, you still have to remember this is a market. 
there's a price at some point where it becomes value on the other side. It's not just in a vacuum. You're only betting one way. It's in a one-way market. You can bet either way. So a lot of people throw the, win- throw the numbers out the window in week one because they want to be on the side of the information. You have to be careful with that because you still need to make a number. Or at least have an idea of a number in your head because it's not like you can blindly bet these if the number goes from 10 to 14 and a half, or maybe it's 17 all of a sudden. I mean, are you betting you got to lay 17 now against UMass? I mean, that's a whole touchdown from where it starts. So keep that in mind. It's, it's not as easy as just picking off, you know, the, the, the trendy teams, the guys that Phil Steele has as a surprise teams. Everybody's betting those or, or whatnot. You got to, you got to think about the fact that, Hey, there's still numbers involved. You're betting numbers here. You're not betting teams. So it's a, it's a very good point that you sort of brought up Andrew and, and, uh, I think we need definitely need the listener to, to key in on that because it's not about just finding good information. It's about applying it the right way and not not using it to the point where it becomes um, you know problematic because it's already in the market in the number already. Yeah, know your enemy. Uh, that, that that's that's the point. My point is in that. All right, we need to key in on you know UMass is you know I don't know. I, I have no I have no clue whether or not UMass is going to be better. And now I tend to lean toward the fact that whoever's betting that number group or whatever uh, was, because that was an outlier. A lot of games haven't even budged yet because guys haven't had a chance to really work. But that game moving as much as it does, I, I respect that move is what I'm saying. Absolutely, res- yeah. And to yeah. a point, though, right? I mean, obviously it gets up to 17 all of a sudden. You're not still thinking about laying 17 No, 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 no. no. But, no. And, and, but my, the overall point of me talking about the, the preseason markets is, you know, there's a huge advantage to just understanding the market. You know, not understanding that, you know, just what, you know, what your enemy, quote unquote, is, you know, what are they thinking right now? And some stuff they think on and move on is going to be correct. And there'll be plenty of stuff that is is incorrect. But knowing and monitoring that, I I think, is an underrated aspect where, you know, too many times the you know, again, you're just focused on what you read in a preseason annual that was written in April. Okay. Whereas you go in and, you know, you could have a team pegged for, let's say you're just an average rec better. You do your work. You have a team pegged for great things. And then you go in and you see that the market has moved the complete opposite way of you. Okay. So now all of a sudden, you know, all your work, you're now you're really kind of questioning yourself was, and it's tricky. We all, we all, we all deal with it, but I, I, I really believe that just kind of, you know, you don't have to monitor every day. But just going in and, and looking at, all right, this game move when and, and where and, and, and just kind of being aware of those things, I think, is is definitely beneficial even to the average uh, the average rec better. Yeah, I mean, you, you should always be gaining information from the market, especially week one. I mean, that's, that's you know, you see the market's open for a couple of months. Um, those numbers, by the time they close, like I said, are, are, are the value is going to be gone for the most part by the time week one arrives. Um, if anything, the value is on the other side of a lot of those moves. So... Um, you always want to glean information from the market. You also want to keep in mind, too, that, and this is kind of a little outside the topic for today, but those week one results for football a lot of times are misleading because, you know, teams are a little nervous that first week, very conservative. Um, they haven't played a, a real game in, a, in, you know, in quite some time. So don't deviate too much from your preseason work. We, we kind of alluded this to a little bit earlier, Andrew. You, you said it. Um, don't deviate from what you found through all your preseason work for the first couple of months based on the result of that first game, you're right? I mean, it, it could just be they were nervous or maybe they just, you know, didn't have the, the, the rhythm yet, the continuity yet. It's taken a while to form. So, you know, don't throw all your work out the window based on one result no. and, and, you know, keep keep going with it and, and, and write it. And don't, you know, now you see two or three games where it's something happening and, and now, you know, now it's the point where maybe you question it and say, hey, Let's throw us out the window. I was definitely wrong on this team. But don't let one game, especially that first game, because I've seen so many times in the NFL. I think I remember the Saints last year in the NFL had a terrible first game. They got torched by, I think, Tampa Bay really badly. Um, They also played badly in week two. And then they went on a run. They won like, I don't know, 11 out of 12 and covered almost every spread during that time frame. They just weren't quite ready for the season. They had, you know, some issues with, with rhythm and continuity. And it takes some time for some teams. They don't all... Not everybody's ready for the season on day one at the same exact rate. Um, some guys take a while to get going. I mean, a good example in baseball, I see is Anthony Rizzo for the Cubs. Every year has a slow April. It takes him like 60 or 70 at-bats, I, I feel like, to finally get in the rhythm where he's swinging the bat well. He's always got an average of like 150 or less that first month, and, and you know he needs to get those at-bats in. He tries to work more in the spring. It just 
for whatever reason, he's not ready on day one of the regular season. So there's there's teams and players that just need time. So don't don't throw all your work out. Don't get too overly excited over the you know the first game or two. Um, believe in your work. Believe in what you did before the season. Um, but also in the back of your head, you got to be thinking about, hey, do I need to pivot sometimes? Because there's a, there's a the line you have to draw and say, hey, all right, I've seen enough. Um, this is real, or is it just an anomaly because it's one or two games? So it, every sport's a little bit different. Um, you're gonna have to learn that just through experience. There's no right way to tell you how to do it. Um, but at the end of the day, the work you do in the preseason, I mean, don't minimize that too much based on the fact that there's one or two games played because that's not it's not the end all be all. Yeah, and even taking it a step further, no market is more reactionary than the college football market from week one to week two. Yeah, I mean, NFL it, it, too. NFL's similar. Yeah. 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 Where I mean, all it takes is in college football. It's 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 wild that there are such reactionary responses because week one is just you know littered with lopsided uh, you know games where you know talent levels, the discrepancy between the two, all these mismatches, and you know you'll you'll see a dominant team, a team that maybe you have pegged for really good things. And like you said, Waz, they they kind of they know they're good, and they'll limp into the season, and they'll play UL Monroe, and they won't look good doing it. And it you know you don't even need to be an expert to say, all right, no big deal. But yet you'll go in the following week, and the markets will react negatively to that. And say, wow, you know this team's no good; they're overrated or whatever. It, it's 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 crazy. Now, what one last thing I I, I want to mention. Where you know, back to the college football, the college basketball, even NFL. It doesn't matter the uh, the sport, but I, my recommendation is that don't worry about knowing everything, particularly every team. And, and what I can recommend to, the, to, to take college football and, and look, if you can get down pat, say three or four conferences, you're you're well ahead of the game. Um, you know, don't panic. Don't don't feel the need where you need to know absolutely everything because you can't. And if you try to, you're going to end up you're, you're going to scramble your brain. and You're going to water down the product. And, and, and I always say this, man, starting the season, it's better to know, say, 20 teams in depth, 20 teams where you feel confident. You take 20 teams and you say, you know what? I know that 15 of these 20 teams I'm going to nail here in week one. And having that as opposed to knowing, you know, maybe 60, 70 percent of 100 teams. Um, so, you know, whittle it down, get a conference you feel comfortable with, attack it from that approach and manage your time rather than. And I used to do it. It's like, well, I got 300 college. You know, I, I got to know what, you know, Coastal Carolina basketball is going to look like. I used to think that way, Waz, and, and, and it was a fool's errand. Yeah, that's probably the best advice for this entire podcast. To be honest with you, uh, we know a lot of listeners out there that, that are that are listening to our podcast each day. They they have full time jobs, and you know I only have ten fifteen hours a week to handicap. There's just no way you can cover every team in college football or college basketball um, as in depth as you need to with that little amount of time each week. So you're right, Andrew. Pick two, three, four conferences. And study those alone and just, you know, handicap those games. And, and you know, obviously, if they're playing non-conference, you need to understand the opponent a little bit. So you might do a little digging, you know, from week to week on the, the teams they're playing. But it's much better to, to be, you know, to master 20, 30 teams or so than to kind of be a jack of all trades and cover them all. You're right. You water it down. Um, your, your brain, by the time the season starts, is just going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to hurt because it's a lot of work. Um, it all kind of melds together. That's why Eddie, I know starts in March because if he did it all in the month before the season, there's no way his brain would be able to, to breathe. Right. I mean, he does, he spreads it out over the course of five, six months and he actually takes off a few weeks before the season starts, which is very unusual, but he'll take a vacation or get away um, right before the season starts. And it kind of clears his head and gets his thinking back to, you know, to being sharp again, which is really brilliant move to be honest with you. And, and uh, I never tried that, but again, don't, Bite off more than you can chew. Uh, pick pick to your strengths. Pick the, the conferences you know well, the teams you know well, and study those. You don't need to cover them all, and you can make a pretty good living or pretty good extra income um, by just knowing you know twenty, thirty, forty teams really well. Doesn't you don't need to know all hundred and thirty uh, FBS teams? Definitely not. That's one of the the only negative of having Eddie on the podcast is there's probably listeners out there <laughs> who think they're like, well, shit, if he can do it, then I can do it. No, you can't. 
Okay. <laughs> and, and if Eddie's ever, a maniac. Yeah. Somebody Eddie's out there. <laughs> you know, I, I, I tell my son this, you know, with, with just life in general, you know, don't stay in your own lane. And, and, and look, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm pretty sharp when it comes to college football, but I wouldn't in a million years even think about attacking college football with as much, you know, I, I just, I can't because I'm, I'm doing other sports and he's got it down. So, and, and look, if that's something that you, uh, you know, uh, you want to become, um, you know, more power to you. Just be, you know, be realistic and start small. Start small and, and, and try not to be, you know, overwhelmed because what happens is you just, you get too many opinions and, and it clouds your judgment. And then, you know, ultimately you do all this work wise. And then once the, once the first, you know, you start making bets, you know, you, you don't know what to do. You're, and you're, you wasted yeah. all that time. So um, put in the work. Don't be afraid to put in the work. We do recommend that you spend time during the uh, the preseason, but be realistic about it and don't panic. The last thing I'll say is is don't panic if you miss out on something in week one. Um, it, th- there'll be other opportunities. Okay, there 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 really w- there really will. In, in fact, for every opportunity you miss, you're going to find an opportunity just by you know monitoring week one. And, and moving on in that week two, week two is always my favorite. Week two and three of college football has always uh, been a joy of mine just because I, I feel really confident in – because, what was one last thing, a lot of that preseason hype, you know, it, even if a team performs differently than all the hype, those hype teams, the, the, the market loves, you know, that are out there, th- th- that'll trickle into weeks two and weeks three. The market's not just going to quit on a team that they were big on. So if you see that team – uh, that anti UMass, and let's say the UMass for what ex- for whatever example uh, goes in and beats Boston College. Um, that doesn't mean you know those guys will come back, and you know they might end up betting you know against UMass again the the, the following week. So it's a uh, it's a tricky game, but uh, again preseason uh, handicap, and I think is it's a fascinating uh, concept was, and, and one that's just uh, there's no there's no finite there's no blueprint out there. You just got to kind of do it on your own. I think. Yeah, and I'll leave with one last thing that we really didn't cover. I don't want to go deep that deep, deep in it because it's it's a whole other topic. But for the pro sports, you know, for NFL, NBA, um, MLB, and hockey, uh, your preseason work could pay off a lot. Betting the preseason games, uh, which we haven't even touched on, you know, it, that work a lot of times. I've seen a lot of guys, especially in the NFL. Um, their ROI, their 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 win loss percentage for preseason NFL is better than it is in regular season because they're just their work they're already doing is setting themselves up for for being prepared and being ready. Um, you know, a month before the season starts, uh, they're much far further ahead of the game than everybody else. They know the depth charts, they know the, the new coaches, what they're thinking about doing, what they want to run. Um, so if you do the work early. Uh, you get the added benefit of having all these additional games to bet during the preseason. And like I said, a lot of guys I know, they make a healthy profit and they're already, you know, their bankroll's already up, you know, five, six, seven units uh, before the regular season even starts. So it's a great advantage um, in the pro sports when you're doing this work already uh, to go ahead and bet those preseason games if you know how to do it. And that's a whole other topic on how to attack those games. We won't get into that today. Um, but like I said, the work kind of goes hand in hand with, with those games a lot of times. Speaking of uh, topics, I'm going to run down the list here really quick. Tips on how to wager second halves. We spoke about that with Wazla last week. The importance of record keeping. The science of in-game sports betting. We had a special guest, Ed Miller, uh, on tips on how to create power ratings. Uh, the impact coaches have on uh, sports betting. Uh, what to expect when purchasing a sports betting uh, service. How to bet on uh, futures. Offshore and Las Vegas sports books. All these just incredibly detailed uh, podcast segments that we have had, as well as uh, articles, they're all available at your uh, fingertips. We encourage you uh, to uh, spend some time on uh, Better IQ. Bookmark them. Uh, you don't have to listen to today. Uh, all the information, it's going to be good a month from now. Some of the stuff's going to be good years from now. Uh, we know the, the sports betting uh, you know, markets uh, change uh, routinely, quickly. Uh, but just the uh, the concepts and some of the topics that we uh, discuss, uh, no doubt, going to help you improve as a uh, sports a better. So again, go to the podcast page. We have the daily stuff. We talk games, uh, but you click on that uh, featured uh, tab, uh, you'll see all the uh, segments that I have. Uh, I've been touting here. 
All right, that's going to wrap up the uh, show. Thanks to our guest here, uh, Waz. Thanks to you, the uh, listener. Be sure to uh, check out the uh, Buy Picks page. I know, look, it's kind of a, a dead time of a year. you got baseball going on. Uh, soccer has been really good. Micah was on last week talking soccer. He's been on a, a tremendous run. They've got a, n- a number of uh, tournaments going on. Be sure to check out his plays. I do have a best bet here going in baseball here for uh, tonight. So options are limited, uh, but they're good options. And uh, everything available on that Buy Picks page at uh, Better IQ. Okay, that'll wrap up the show. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back again tomorrow.